We are concluding our series on dynamic duos, uh, biblical characters whose relationships, whose relationships are great examples for us to follow. Uh, these days, deep, lasting, committed friendships are difficult to come by. And we've been looking at these dynamic duos and asking, you know, what is it about them that makes them so compelling? What is it that makes them effective together? What characteristics make them dynamic? Uh, we still have a deep longing for friendship, and we can learn from these duos. Whether it's uh, Paul and Barnabas and their fierce faith and iron sharpens iron principle, or Ruth and Naomi and their deep-seated loyalty, and the whole idea of a friend who sticks closer than a brother or sister. Or Moses and Aaron and how they complemented each other, working off of each other's uh, strengths. And this morning, we're going to look at two prophets from the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha, and leaving a living legacy by investing in your friends. A uh, scripture reader this morning is Patty Southfield. Uh, Patty, if you can make your way on up to the podium. And as she does so, I'm going to ask if you're able to please stand, face the center of the room. Uh, we read from the center of the room because we believe scripture is to be central uh, in our lives. And again, the passage that Patty's going to be reading, uh, Elisha has been following Elijah for years. And this passage is their final episode together. And so, Patty, whenever you're ready, please read from 2 Kings chapter 2. Okay, hear God's word. Elijah taken up to heaven, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Patty, thank you very much. You may be seated. You know, the whole idea in investing is something is the, that we get some kind of return on what we invest. And there are so many things that we can invest in today, you know, stocks and bonds. Uh, my dad has actually told, started talking to me about how he invests in options. And so I'm learning terms like calls and puts and this kind of thing. Uh, you can invest in real estate. Uh, you can invest in collectibles, uh, some traditional collectibles or coins or maybe baseball cards, but you can collect in all sorts of things. You can collect in all things, either Star Wars or Disney or Marvel. Um, within the last year, you probably, are, are, many of you have heard or been familiar with this whole thing called Bitcoin. 
Um, it's been in the news quite a bit in the last year, and one of the reasons is that it's a sort of a new, different form of currency. It's called cryptocurrency. It doesn't really have any inherent value. It, it's not tied to anything. There's nothing tangible about it. It's this decentralized digital uh, currency, and one of the reasons it's been in the news is because it's so volatile. Um, within the last 52 weeks, uh, its value has sold for either $2,000 a Bitcoin or $20,000 a Bitcoin. Just in the last 52 weeks, that's how much it's fluctuated. And it's currently selling uh, for $6,000 uh, for each Bitcoin. And if you think about that, that means that depending on when you bought it, you've either tripled your money or your money has been shrunk to a third of what it was. Um, but what about investing in the people in our lives. Now, the quick, easy answer to investing is people is investing in people is to invest in our kids or in our grandkids uh, or in our families. And quite honestly, everything in this message could easily apply to family. And investing in your family is a good and necessary thing. But I want to point out something that Jesus said. Jesus said, when talking about the greatest love, he said. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Notice what Jesus didn't say. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's family. It's not what he said. Not for one's family. Greater love is laying down your life for your friends. It's an interesting little distinction. See, again, when you think about family, well, the whole idea of blood is thicker than water. And so when it comes to my kids, at least, I sort of have this instinct to sacrifice and invest in my kids. Or for those of you who have grandkids, I'm sure it's not that big of a stretch of, yeah, I want to invest in them. But to sacrifice for my friends, I don't have that same instinct to sacrifice for my friends like I have the instinct to sacrifice for my kids. You see, it's going to take a greater love to sacrifice for my friends like I sacrifice for my family. But if we're going to have lasting friendships, we need to invest in our friends. Now, some background to Elijah and Elisha, and you can read more about this in 1 Kings 17 to 19. Um, but some bullet points on those chapters is Elijah is this prophet in Israel, and the king at the time is a king named Ahab, and Ahab has instituted a worship of a foreign god named Baal, and Elijah confronts King Ahab about Baal worship. See, the Israelites were commanded to worship the Lord only. In fact, scripture even says that if you don't worship the Lord only, God tells Israel he's going to withhold rain from their land. And so Elijah comes to Ahab and says, you're worshiping Baal, it's not going to rain. And for three years, it doesn't rain. And then at the end of that three years, Elijah has this battle with the prophets of Baal on a place called Mount Carmel. And if you know any story about Elijah at all, this is the story you know, where Elijah arranges this contest between him and 450 prophets of Baal. And each of them call on their God to see which God will respond with fire. And it's the Lord, in a dramatic way, responds with fire. And Elijah has all the prophets of Baal killed. But then Elijah flees out of fear for his life to the mountain of God. It's sort of a, one of those end of his ropes kind of moments. Because even after the victory on Carmel, Ahab and his wife Jezebel still have the power in the land of Israel. And so a discouraged Elijah flees. He's disillusioned. He's basically ready to quit. And God meets Elijah on the mountain and he tells Elijah, go make Elisha your successor. And in that encounter, with God, Elijah tells God, I've been very zealous for you. Again, Elijah, he won the contest on Carmel, and it still wasn't enough. You see, and this is us. We're all about winning contests. 
and not sure what the details of your contest look like, but most of our contests involve setting goals, sacrificing to try to attain those goals, and then we either achieve or don't achieve those goals, and then we establish new goals. But the message of the Elijah story is, what do you do when you've accomplished all of your goals and it still isn't enough? Elijah won his great contest and it still wasn't enough. You see, we act as if we achieve our legacy through what we do. But legacy isn't so much about what we do, it's more about who we impact. And we spend most of our time investing in our goals and so little time investing in our friends. And if we're not making an impact on our friends, with our friends, well, what kind of friendships do we have? I want to give us some legacy principles in the quest for a living legacy. And principle number one is imitation. Living legacy principle number one is imitation. Verse 9 from our passage this morning says, When they crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? And Elisha said, Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Hey, when you were a kid, think back to when you were a little kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Remember that great question? What do you want to be when you grow up? Now, most kids, they say things like, I want to be a policeman, or I want to be a teacher, or I want to be a doctor. Why do kids answer with those things? I don't know if I've ever heard a little kid, when you ask them, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a phlebotomist, <laughs> or a civil engineer, or a taxidermist. Right? Kids never, it's always policeman, teacher, doctor. And why those things? Well, again, it's not that great of a mystery because kids know who those people are. They've had interactions with teachers. They know who police officers are. Again, they probably have visited the doctor. Now, a quick little parenting tip. This is a freebie for those of you with parents of little kids. If, if I could go back in time, I would tell myself to do this, okay? Train your kids. Just tell them you'll give them some money or something, okay? Train your kids that when someone asks them that question, tell them to answer, I want to be a phlebotomist or taxidermist, whatever you, they can pronounce, okay? Civil engineer. And then explain to them what those things are. People will be blown away by your children, okay? Um, free advice, I won't charge you for that one. When I was a kid... I wanted to be a real estate agent. That's what I wanted to do. And why did I want to be a real estate agent? Because that's what my dad did at the time. He was into real estate. And so when people ask me, what do you want to be when you grow up? I picked what my dad did. You see, we want to be like the people we like. We want to be like the people we like. So what do you want to be when you grow up? The kids, the answer I probably hear most from kids is teacher, which makes sense. Because other than their parents, who do kids spend most of their time with? Good chance they spend most of their time with, with teachers. And there's also a really good chance that the kids who say they want to be teachers, they like the teachers they've had. And so they want to be like them. So they want to be teachers. We want to be like the people we like. And this doesn't end... As we age, we still look for people to imitate. And if you don't think that's true, I've got two words. Celebrity endorsements, right? Companies know what they're doing when they hire celebrities because they know it doesn't matter how old we are. We want to be like the people we like. Elisha wanted to be, wanted a double portion of Elijah's spirit because he wanted to be like Elijah. In college, I had this roommate uh, named Stuart. And Stuart was just one of those guys with a great personality. He was fun to hang out with. And what I liked about Stuart, one of the things I liked about Stuart, he always had a positive way with people. And I watched how he interacted with people, and he always had something positive to say, even in fairly negative, tense situations. And I really liked that. Now, it wasn't envy. Envy is this resentful 
awareness of someone else's abilities and advantages. I wasn't resentful. I thought it was really cool. And so ever since then, within my own personality, I've tried to be more positive with people. Do you have friends that you would like to be more like? Or do you have any characteristics worth imitating? The second living legacy principle is intentionality. Intentionality. I want to go back to when Elijah calls Elisha to follow him and just look at what specifically Elijah does when he calls Elisha. It's in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19, and it says, So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, who was plowing, he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. And Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. The call to Elisha came in the simple form of Elijah putting his cloak on him. It's an act of intentionality. And then if we go back to the passage that we read this morning in verse 8, it says Elijah took his cloak when they reached the Jordan River and he rolled it up and he struck the water with it. And the water divided to the right and to the left. And the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Then the chariots of fire come and separate the two and Elijah is taken up to heaven in a whirlwind and then Elijah's cloak falls and we read in verses 13 to 15, Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood to the, on the bank of the Jordan. And he took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Verse 8 and verse 14 from that passage, they're almost identical. In verse 8, Elijah strikes the water with the cloak, and the water divides. In verse 14, Elisha strikes the water with the cloak, and the water divides. And it's the same cloak, the same cloak that Elijah used to call Elisha in the first place. Now, this story isn't a story about some magical cloak. This is a story about how Elijah invested in Elisha, and now that Elijah is gone, his spirit is on Elisha. A legacy doesn't happen by accident. Doesn't happen by accident. If we want to leave a legacy with our friends, we will intentionally need to spend time with them. We will intentionally need to be interested in what's happening in their lives. We will intentionally need to find ways to connect with them. We will intentionally need to be there for them when they need us. And it's so hard because we are so busy. I hardly have time to do fun things with my friends, much less be connected with what's going on in their lives. But a legacy doesn't happen by accident. We need to be intentional in investing in our friends. And the third living legacy principle is impact. It's impact. If we're going to take the time to invest in our friends, we will make an impact. If we go back to verse 9, when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? And Elisha says, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Now, as I said earlier, Elisha wanted to be like Elijah. And when you make that kind of impact, a legacy outlives you. It outlives you. Elijah's battle on Mount Carmel did not do much to change the nation of Israel because he was on the run for his life shortly after his greatest victory. And so he invests years into his friend Elisha. And what was the impact? Well, Elisha was a prophet for 60 years after Elijah was taken into heaven. And Elisha asks for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. 
And Ray Vanderlaan pointed out to me that if you just look at the miracles, the miracles of Elijah and the miracles of Elisha, you'll see a numerical relationship. So if we were to put Elijah's miracles up there, and that's just the verse references up there, and then if we were to put Elisha's miracles, and if you just did a quick count, what you would find is that Elisha's miracles are basically double what Elijah did. He asked for a double portion, did almost twice as many miracles. But if you count, he, before Elisha died, he fell one short. One short of double. But after Elisha died, this happened in 2 Kings 13. Once while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. And so they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. And when the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. So he got his one more. He did. He doubled the number of miracles Elijah did. And so even after Elisha's death, Elijah's legacy in him lived on. Who is someone in your life that you want to model your life after? 1 Corinthians 15 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Well, the opposite is true as well. Look, if you don't have anyone in your life worth imitating, may I humbly suggest that you find some friends who are. And then another question is, who is someone in your life that you want to invest in? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 11, the Apostle Paul writes, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now, if you're like me, some of you are thinking, well, I'm not a good enough follower to do that. I'm not Apostle Paul. Well, look, Apostle Paul was far from perfect. And the Bible is full of examples of flawed men and women, just like us, who make an impact on others. And I'm confident that in some way that many of you are following Christ's example. In some way. Look, I know you're not perfect. I know you make mistakes, got skeletons in the closet. I get that. But I am still confident that there is some way in which you are following Christ's example. And God can use you, flaws and all, to make an impact. And we use Christ as our example as we follow Christ hopefully someone else follows us. And that's why we say in our vision statement that we want to model the life of Jesus Christ throughout the Magic Valley. Who is someone in your life that you want to model your life after? And who is someone in your life that you want to invest in? You know, the same Jesus who said, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. The good news is that same Jesus gave his life for ours. It was his greatest investment. That he considered us friends. And when we follow him by investing in our friends, we continue his legacy. Look, we're concluding our series on dynamic duos. These days, deep, lasting, committed friendships are difficult to come by. And it's hard to give up your life for your friends if all you have are acquaintances. Look, we are less equipped to resolve conflict, there's this decreasing self-awareness, the value of lifelong friendships is depreciating, and yet with all of that, the need for long-lasting friendships is the same. In fact, we need them now more than ever. Evaluate your friendships. 
The things that make friendships thrive that we've learned from these dynamic duos, whether it's faith or loyalty or benefiting from each other's strengths or investing in our friends, these are things that we need more of, not less of. Friends, they make life more abundant. Friends, they give strength when we need it. And friends are a blessing worth working for. Please pray with me. And Lord, as we come before you, we again are just thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus and how he laid down his life for his friends and we continue to um, benefit from that to this very day. So Lord, I ask that you would... Um, Show us on our, in our hearts the people in our lives that we could imitate and the people of, in our lives that we could invest in. And Lord, help us follow the example of Jesus and in so make an example for others to follow. Again, Lord, we thank you for the blessing of the friendships we have. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.